who are here, welcome to those of you who are watching on YouTube and Facebook. We're getting started about half a minute late here. But anyway, good to see everybody as we still have people coming in the door. And uh, we're going, we've got a new song here that we're going to do today. Uh, we're not doing the copyrighted hymns uh, from, from hymnals and that type of thing. We've got a letter about that. So we're doing our own music and I hope that you like it. Uh, I have written uh, the melodies and... And, and uh, Rachel has done most of the lyrics, just about all the lyrics, and she's doing a great job. So they're going to come up here right now and sing. Sure. And after that, I have a message on how to have, now this is part two from last week, the faith of God made easy. The reason you and I haven't been moving mountains is because it is very, very hard to have the faith of God. Today I'm going to show you exactly how to have the faith of God and you're going to start seeing miracles in your life if you'll take to heart what you're going to hear today. So stay tuned. Now I want to have these young ladies to come up here and uh, sing for us. Miss Rachel and Miss LaKayla, if they'll come up and they're going to lead us, lead the church or hey you folks can do, look, read the words or sing them, whatever you want to do. Alright, y'all come on up. Sing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Let's stand up and worship God. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. God is blessing us. Um, I mean, we God has given us talent here. Because I can't write lyrics and she can. And where's LaKayla? Are we lost her? Oh, she had to 
the rapture occurred. Yes, and we all got left behind. And we all got left behind. Good to see you all. <laughs> um, good to see everybody here. Like I said a few moments ago, today I'm going to be showing you how to have, this is part two of last week, how to have the faith of God and, and how to make it easy to have the faith of God. That, the biggest problem is if I say, let's go move a mountain, you know you can do it because the Bible says you can, but you have to have the faith of God to do it. Do you have that much faith? Today I'm going to show you a, a very easy way to get it. And the times are tough, and they're getting tougher. I predicted, what was it, 15 months ago? Well, a little bit longer than that. It's before the, the uh, election back in 2020, and I said, you know, uh, I was listening to the debates, and I said, if Joe Biden is elected, and if he carries out his promises, we're going to have tremendous inflation. Now, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not an economist, but I've got sense enough to know that if you print money that you don't have. We're over $29 trillion in debt, so we don't have the money. But he was predicting, he said, we're going to spend $5 trillion on whatever it was, build back better. And I said, you can't do that. If he does, it will cause tremendous inflation. The Republicans won't let him spend quite that much, but what he has done, see, it's, it's against the law for you to make money in your basement. That's counterfeiting. But the United States Treasury can go there and they can just print money and print money and print money. So the money that's in your wallet goes down in value. That's how it works. So let's say they go out here and they spend $10 trillion next year. Your money will be almost worthless. So the money that you've got in the bank that you've been saving for retirement is going to be worthless. I know I haven't prayed yet. I'm going to. I haven't started the sermon yet. But I want to just share a few things with you. The book of Revelation, which many Christians don't read, predicts that in the last days, inflation is going to be so bad, it's going to take a day's wages to buy bread. A day's wages. That's in the Bible. And you think it's bad now. The Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world. I mean, they, they, we get a lot of our wheat from the Ukraine. And right now, the farmers are not able to go out there and farm their fields. That alone is going to cause within the next six months your prices to go up. When you go to the market to buy bread, bread's made from wheat. I'm not a prophet, never claimed to be a prophet. It's common sense. Your prices are going to go up. So it's going to happen. There's no way to get around that. So I have a few announcements I want to make, uh, and then we'll get right into the sermon. Announcements about what's happening in the world right now. Jesus said in Luke 21, 36, that if we watch and pray always, we can escape all these things that's going to come to pass, and we can. But it's going to take faith to get through it. That's what we have to keep in mind. It will take faith. And you, you're going to need to live by faith. Not just because it's a nice thing for a Christian to do, but how are you going to eat when you can't take the mark of the beast? Jesus. Read Revelation 14. What's going to happen to people who take the mark of the beast? You read it yourself. Find out what happens. You don't dare take the mark of the beast. Now, I know me, and I'm a man. I know how the men think in here. I'm macho. I can handle it. That's great, but could you stand there and watch your wife or your little daughter die? You may say, okay, okay. I'll do anything you say. Just don't touch my wife. Don't touch my little girl. You see the problem? I don't want to be in that situation. I want God to protect me. So the number one thing we need to do, remember what a Philadelphian Christian is, this one who keeps God's word? We need to start keeping God's word. We need to start keeping his commandments and really living by every word of God. Folks, today this is just religion, what I'm talking about. I, that's all it is. It's church. It's religion. You can walk out of here and go out to the parking lot and say, that was amusing, wasn't it? Yes, that was. Where, where do you want to go eat? Yeah, and, and for, about, about this, this afternoon you've already forgotten what you heard. But what I'm talking to you about today is going to help you get through the next perhaps eight or nine years. Maybe longer, we don't know. So what we're talking about here is not religion, it's not doctrine, it's not just religious beliefs, it's what's going to be happening possibly in the next two years. Listen to this. Last week, Kim Jong-un, however you say his name, the president of North Korea, here's a quotation, quote, threatened to use nuclear weapons against his enemies, unquote. That guy's a nut. He's insane. Nuclear weapons? Folks, when that happens, we're looking at possibly, I don't know, an all-out nuclear war. And if that happens, your way of life is gone. There'll be no food to eat. People right here in America will be starving. Now, uh, Obama told um, 
Trump, Trump asked him, what's the worst problem of facing America? He said, Korea. He, he said, we expect to have a war with North Korea. Trump did something that a lot of us would have been afraid to do. He said, if you attack us, you're going to face destruction like you've never seen before. We're thinking, oh, no, man, this is, this is scary. But you know what? It scared the daylights out, out of him. He said, that Trump fella is to be taken seriously. So he met with Trump in Vietnam. He met with him in Singapore. They talked things over. Everything's cool. Saved us a war with North Korea. All right, now Kim Jong-un has no fear at all of our current president, and now he's threatening his enemies with nuclear war. We're his biggest enemy. They saw what happened in Afghanistan. I don't want to give you a news report, but I'm leading up to something here. <clears throat> they saw what's been happening with our economy, what's going on, one debacle after another, and all these things going on, and so now he's threatening us with nuclear war. Uh, Iran now, because they went back to the Obama era uh, thing with Iran, and Trump had Iran at bay. They wouldn't dare touch us. But now they're wanting reparations for the sanctions that, that Trump put on them. And so now they're coming against us. They're threatening Israel. It is getting very, very serious. Um, now, wait a minute. Before I go any further, you didn't come to church to hear bad news. You want to hear something uplifting, something encouraging. I have something encouraging to give you. Before I go any further with the news, and then I want to get into my sermon. This is not my sermon, but I want to tell you this. Jesus may come back in our lifetime. <clears throat> and if he does, he may come back in the 40th Jubilee, which I won't go into again because you've heard me talk about it so much over the last year. The Jews have a legend the Messiah will come in a Jubilee. The next one is going to be within the next eight to ten years, we think. And that will be number 40 from the time Jesus first came. And I've said for several years, wouldn't it be interesting if Christ were to come back at the 40th Jubilee? That will also be the 120th Jubilee from the time of Adam. It will also be the 2,000th anniversary from the cross. All of that is coinciding. Does that mean anything? Maybe not a thing. But what I'm going to read to you here in the news means something. Because I told you that if the, that the 40th Jubilee would very likely occur around 2031, 2030 maybe, but 2031, we're looking at nine to 10 years from now. You say, but Keith, things aren't happening. Jesus can't come back that soon. I've still got plenty of time to get ready. You're already ready spiritually. You're already converted. You're already Christians. But you know, Jesus didn't promise protection to all Christians. A lot of the churches say, man, if you got saved, you got it made. Uh-uh. Those people in Sardis... Not only does Christ not promise them protection when the tribulation comes, he says, if you don't straighten out, if you don't straighten up, your name's coming out of the book of life. I'm going to blot it out. So if you're a spiritually dead Christian like Sardis, you're going through the great tribulation. If you're a lukewarm Christian like the Laodiceans, you're going through the great tribulation. You will take the mark of the beast or you will be beheaded or martyred in some way. So are you ready for that? Today, after today's sermon, when you learn how to walk in the faith of God, it's going to help you get through the hard times ahead. It's going to help you. A few more announcements before we get into the message. Here is another quotation. Quote, Russia's foreign minister, this came off the news. This week, quote, Russia's foreign minister said the conflict in Ukraine could escalate into World War III. They're talking about it like they're very serious about it. This warning results from America's increase in arms. So, uh, shipment to Ukraine. Yesterday, just yesterday, I was watching the news, and I heard this on Fox News. Uh, actually, this was on the screen when they were talking. They put this at the bottom of the screen, and I wrote it down. Quote, Putin has repeatedly threatened nuclear war. You know, it's one thing to say the possibility is there, but we'll never do it. But now they're talking about it. Now they're acting like, hey, we may really do this. And Americans are asleep. The church is asleep. What does it say in the book of Matthew that there were ten virgins representing the body of Christ, the bride? It says all ten were asleep. Most Christians today are asleep. And they're not aware of what's happening around them. Oh, they pick up a little bit of the news here or there. But they're not aware of the fact that we may be nine years away from the second coming of Jesus. And he comes back and sets up his kingdom after the great and terrible day of the Lord, which comes after the great tribulation. And what did Jesus say in Matthew 24, 21, and 22? The great tribulation will be the worst time in the history of the world since the beginning of the world. There will be no time like It's going to be much worse than World War II. 
Revelation indicates up to one-fourth of mankind may die in three and a half years. Then after that, immediately after that, you have the heavenly signs and then the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord kills one-third of what's left. Now, folks, you say that couldn't happen in the next nine or ten years. You know what? I hope it doesn't. I'm not ready for all that to happen. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but think about it. Are you ready for all this to happen? We know it's going to happen. We've studied Revelation. We know it's going to happen, but are you ready for it to happen that soon? I'll be honest. I'm not. Now, spiritually, yeah. You know, if I died today of a heart attack or if you died today, hopefully we are ready to meet our maker. But I don't want to go through all these hard times. I don't want to, I don't want to pay $4 at the pump either for gas. Do you? I don't want to go to the grocery store and pay, pay higher prices. And what we see now, you think this is bad? If this war continues in Ukraine and they can't give us our wheat that we need, if this continues, prices are going to go sky high in the next year to a year and a half. It's going to go sky high. It's going to be happening real soon. It's going to be happening very soon. The farmers right now don't have fertilizer to put on the crops. Yeah, I didn't know that. Farmers don't have the fertilizer and that they need. Brilliant. Politicians have told them to use cow manure and chicken manure. Well, they're already doing that. They use everything. They use everything they can. But it's all it's not enough. It's all running out. They don't have the fertilizer. And it's, they're not going to be producing food like you think. Yeah. Gonna. And I heard one, uh, one, one person this past week, I think it was, uh, they were interviewing him. He said most of our, uh, like our vegetables and so on, come from Mexico. And Mexico's not happy with us right now. So what I'm telling you is we are in a very dangerous situation. In my entire lifetime, the closest, uh, I mean, I've never seen it this bad. But in the history of the United States, the worst time we had was during 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when actually, y'all may not know this. Some of you, if you've done the study, you know about it, but they ev evacuated Washington, D.C., the Congress was evacuated. They left. They were out of the area. John F. Kennedy, the president, ordered them to evacuate because of the, it, the very, very real threat of the nuclear war happening in 1962. We have never had anything like that until this year. All right. I don't want to scare you, but what I'm trying to say is you and I don't have to worry about these hard times if we're really keeping God's law and obeying his commandments and not just going to church to be religious, but really coming to learn God's word. Just a few more announcements. <clears throat> now, there was a man, uh, he's a former member of the Army Special Forces. His name is Joe Kent. And he was interviewed, and I just saw this yesterday. He was actually interviewed Thursday night. I didn't get to see it till yesterday. He's running for the Senate in the upcoming uh, primaries in the state where he is. Based on comments that Joe Biden said, Kent was in, interviewed uh, this past Thursday night. Carlson asked him this question. He said, the administration, I'm quoting now, the administration tells us we are at war right now with Russia, meaning Cold War. And I'm just wondering what percentage of the American population knows we are at war with Russia. Mm. Joe Kent made this statement. He said that the United States is provoking the Russians to war. Do you realize that Putin has not attacked any of our troops or anybody like that? He said, quote, this is a quotation. Joe Kent said, we are in a very dangerous, we're in very dangerous waters right now, unprecedented. We've been here, we've never been here before, and there are no uh, guardrails right now for what the Biden regime is doing to this nation. Now, the intelligence has leaked out that America has shot down at least one um, Russian aircraft that was carrying a couple of hundred troops, and we killed them all. Uh, we felt destroy their ships. Russia is getting mad at us. It's like we're provoking them to a war. Putin is already threatening nuclear war. And America is like asking for it. We got crazy people in government. There are insane people in Iran, insane people in North Korea. Insane Putin, I think, is off. Something's wrong with him. And now we look at our own government in America. What's going on? It could be that all of these things are coming together to allow Jesus to return at the 40th Jubilee after all. You know, two years ago when I started telling you all that, you say, oh, well, it may happen. And, and, and it may never happen in our lifetime. Part of us want to believe it won't. But if Jesus does come back in our lifetime, folks, this is going to happen. You're going to live to see it if he comes back in our lifetime. 
So we want to be prepared. Just a few more things here. Uh, he added these words, quote, if it goes really wrong, we may be in a nuclear conflict, unquote. And then he added, quote, they say, hey, we need to saddle up and go to war with Russia. And we say, why? And absolutely not. And there's a constitutionally appointed process to follow. This needs to go to a war powers debate on the floor of Congress, end of quote. A war powers debate. Folks, it's coming to a head. Now, leaks have come out from in our intelligence, our CIA or whoever, that Americans are now killing Russian generals, they're shooting down aircraft. Um, um, and they are bragging about it. That's crazy. Kent added, quote, the intelligence community right now that is leaking this information, that is trying to get us into this war, these people need to be found out, held accountable, stripped of their jobs, and their clearances because they're pushing us toward a war. All right, maybe nothing will happen. In 1938, was it 38 or 39, when Chamberlain had gone to meet Hitler and he comes back, and you've seen the famous newsreel where he's holding up the, the paper that Hitler had signed. He said, there will be peace in our time. See, he signed it. And right after that, then Hitler invaded Poland, and now we have World War II. But he said, oh, there's going to be peace in our time. You know, the Apostle Paul said, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. And Jesus said, if you're in Judea and you're on the housetop because they have flat roofs over there, run. Don't even come back inside the house. Run. Get out of there. You mean don't come back and get my Bible? You better not. Because it's going to be sudden destruction and Jerusalem is ground zero. So you may be over there on a Holy Land tour. And when they set up the abomination of desolation, you better run like crazy. Do we have any questions at all online? All right, let's ask God's blessing on this message. Father in heaven, we ask you to bless the message and bless each one who hears this here in this room, those on YouTube. God, bless us, anoint me, and let everyone understand what I'm trying to present to them today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, last week, let me segue into what I want to talk about today because I didn't finish last week's message. I mentioned last week, Mark 11, 22, and I wrote some of this on the board. In, in verse 22, the King James says, in all modern... English versions say, have faith in God. The Greek is written in the genitive case, and it means have the faith of God. And if you have a good center reference margin, it tells you that right in the reference margin. Have the faith of God. Well, what kind of faith does God have? Absolute assurance. And then he tells you in verse 23, for truly I say to you, if you say something and you believe that what you say comes to pass, you'll have whatever you say. That's the faith of God. When God said, let there be light, he wasn't thinking, Boy, I sure hope this works. No, when he said, let there be light, he knew it happened. And so that's how we have to be. When we make a decree, when we say something, we have to believe that what we say comes to pass. Uh, Matthew 21, 21, you know, that Matt, this is Matthew's account where the fig tree, Jesus merely spoke to it. The fig tree died. And so the next day, Peter says, wow, look at that fig tree. I'm paraphrasing it. He didn't actually say, wow. But anyway, he said, that fig tree that you put a curse on, it's withered up already. And it says, this is, now you have to read Matthew 21 and Mark 11 to get, put the two accounts together. He said, it, Mark 11, 20, uh, 3, no, verse 22 says, have the faith of God. Said he answered Peter. The answer to Peter's exclamation was, you need to have the faith of God. Now, you go back to Matthew 21. He says, because if you'll have faith and doubt not, and there's where you and I miss it. We've got faith, but then there's that little bit of, well, you know, what if. For example, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, how many of you believe that you have faith? You'd all raise your hand. Let's go down to the swimming pool. Who wants to be first to walk across the water? I'll take your picture. Most of you would say it's too cold. <laughs> And I didn't bring my bathing suit. You see what I'm saying? We've got faith. But probably none of us here have walked on water. I mean, I may, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, besides when it's not raining, it's, the parking lot's wet. We, we're supposed to have the faith of God. Jesus commands us. That's in the imperative in the Greek. Imperative means he commands us to do it. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, Keep my commandments. He said, have the faith of God. That's a commandment. It's not optional. 
Now, in Matthew 21, what he said was, if you have faith and doubt not, that's the faith of God, you will not only do what is done to the fig tree, but if you say to the mountain, etc. I've got a fig tree in my backyard. I sure don't want to curse it. I was talking to my brother a couple of days ago, and I was telling him about, you know, the faith of God. And I, every time I study faith, I look out there at that fig tree. I can see it out in my back window. And my brother said, don't you curse that tree. <laughs> you know, you have the power to do that in the name of Jesus. Now, last week I explained one of the reasons that we have trouble is because we know in our heart we can't talk to a tree. We can't move a mountain. We know that in our heart. We know that. Let's admit we can't do it. Jesus said, of my own self, I can do nothing. All right? Now, that's my introduction. Jesus said he couldn't do anything. He said, but the Father in me, he does the works. That's John 5, 30 and John 14, verse 10. All right. Now, is it possible that you and I could say something and it comes to pass? Yeah. We could say something and it will come to pass. Let me read to you a few scriptures. Um, by the way, I didn't read Lamentations 3. Look, before I go to, I'm going to go to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 3. And you, you, I'm giving you these references. You can either turn to them or you can write them down and look them up later and do your own study today. But Lamentations 3.37 explains Mark 11. It says, who is he that says, and it really does come to pass when the Lord didn't command it. Now, you may tell your child, go do this, go do that. That's not supernatural. But when you speak to a tree, and that tree obeys you, that's in the supernatural. When you tell a mountain to move, that's in the supernatural. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, Matthew 18, 18 says, Whatever you bind will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose will be loosed on the earth. You do it, God will back you up. Lamentations 3.37 explains how to have the faith of God. So let me tell you this. If you knew that God was walking behind you, say for the next three days, and tells you everything you say, I'll back you up. Everything, Lord? Yeah, everything you say, I'm going to back you up. You just say the word, I'll back you up. Well, by George, you'd be talking to fig trees and fruit trees and you know, apple trees and everything else. Just think of all the things you would do. But you see, we don't understand that God has promised to stand behind us and back us up. Now, it's circular reasoning. How, do I, how easy it is to have the faith of God? Let me tell you. Let me answer that question right now. It's easy to have the faith of God if you know God is standing behind you. But how do you know if he's standing behind you? What that verse says is, who is he that says and it comes to pass when the Lord commands it not? But wait a minute. You and I have said a lot of things that did not come to pass because the Lord wasn't standing behind us. Do you understand? So when it does come to pass, the Lord will stand behind us. So how can I know that I know that I know that he's going to stand behind me? Jesus said this. You know, in algebra, you learned in high school, if A equals B and B equals C, then A has to equal C. All right? Here's what Lamentation says. If God stands behind you, it's going to come to pass. You understand? How do we know God's going to stand behind us? Jesus said, if you believe that what you say comes to pass, you'll have anything you say. How does he know you're going to have everything that you say? Because he knows that if you use the faith of God, that God will stand behind you. So if I know God is standing behind me, shoot, man, I got, it's so simple to have faith. Hey, Lord, let's go to Appalachian Mountains. God says, let's go. So he gets in the car with me. We go to the Appalachian Mountains, and I say, let's move a few mountains around. God says, whatever you want to do, Keith. That one, that one, and that one. What I'm saying is it is so easy to move a mountain if you know God is standing behind you. Matthew 18 says, whatever you bind will be bound in heaven. Now, what you're binding is not in heaven, it's on the earth. But whatever you on earth bind, God in heaven will bind. But you bind it first. But wait a minute now, this is circular reasoning here. It goes hand in hand. In order for me to know that I know that I know God is standing behind me, I have to have the faith of God first. But I can't have the faith of God if I don't know God is standing behind me. Did y'all get that? How do I know God is standing behind me? Because I've got the faith of God. How can I have the faith of God? Only if I know God is standing behind me. That's like a, what is that, a catch-22 situation. Do we have any questions? All 
I hope I haven't lost you yet. This is important. How do I have the faith of God? Because I know he stand behind me. Well, but sometimes he doesn't always stand behind us. Because you've prayed for people and they died. And you've done a lot of things and it didn't work for you. The reason is because God didn't back up what you said. And the reason he didn't back up what you said is because you didn't have the faith you need to have. Now, don't forget that in 1 Corinthians 13, I think it's verse 2, Paul said, if I had enough faith to move mountains. No, he said all faith. He said if I had all faith. That's what it takes to move a mountain is all faith. But then Jesus said, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can move a mountain. That seems to be a contradiction. And I've talked about this before, and I'll make it very brief. He didn't say if you have faith the size of a grain of mustard seed. He said if you have faith like a seed. What do you do with a seed? You sow it. Mm -hmm. And when you sow that seed, it begins to grow. And Matthew 13 says that even a mustard seed will eventually get so large the birds can come and lodge in the branches of it. When your mustard seed grows to that point, then you have what Paul called all faith. And everybody here agrees you're going to need all faith to move that mountain, right? Mm -hmm. But see, if God was riding in your car with you and you went to the Appalachian Mountains, it wouldn't be a problem, would it? You know you could do it. So uh, you say, well, Keith, you haven't answered the question. How do we get to that point? we gotta, we got to know that. All right, 1 Samuel 3, 19. Samuel was a prophet of God. Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. Now, I think the Lord is with you. But notice, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Everything Samuel said came to pass. None of his words fell to the ground. That's very interesting. Now, in chapter 9, go over three or four pages here. In chapter 9, and verse 6, if you're with me, <clears throat> or if you're not, just write it down. Look it up later. Saul was talking to his servant. He said, uh, Behold, now there is in the city a man of God. He's an honorable man. All that he says comes surely to pass. Everything Samuel said, he had a reputation. Everything he said came to pass. I want to go to Proverbs now. If you're writing this down, it's Proverbs 22. Are there any questions or comments so far? Uh, Patty Orr in New Mexico posted that your words are easy to understand. So they're understanding it. <coughs> good, good. It's resonating. I'm glad it's resonating. That's great. Now, here's what, and I appreciate the comments. So I want to make sure I'm getting through. Proverbs 22 and verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthrows the words of the transgressor. Aren't you glad? The transgressor says, I'm going to kill you. God says, no, you won't. I'm not going to let you. He's my servant. She's my servant. 22, 12, verse 12. God overthrows their words. But yet Samuel was a man of God, and everything he said did not fall to the ground. Everything he said came to pass. That's how you want to be. Jesus said, whosoever, whosoever. Now verse 17 here says, bow down your ear. That sounds like the song we sang a while ago. Bow down, lift up your hands. Oh, It says, bow down your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart unto my knowledge, God says. Verse 18, it's a pleasant thing if you keep them within you, they shall... With all be fitted in your lips. Uh, verse 19. That your trust may be in the Lord. That your trust may be in the Lord. All right. So we have to have trust in God because he can move the mountain. You, you and I can't do that. But if he stands behind us, all we got to do is speak to us. What's the question? J.R. is asking, according to his will, is this the key to getting what we ask? Yeah, this is the key to getting what we ask. You have to believe that you receive when you pray, and then anything you pray for. Verse 24, Mark 11, 24, whatever you desire, when you pray, not next week, when you pray, today, believe you receive and you'll have. I've studied that in the Greek text. I've looked at, at it every way in which I've looked it up very thoroughly in different Greek lexicons. It literally is in the present tense. Believe you receive, many right now. Yes, sir. All is in his will. Well, that is true. And here's what a lot of people say. For those of you who didn't hear this uh, on YouTube and Facebook, he said, as long as it's in God's will. Here's where a lot of us miss it. I'm glad you brought that up, by the way. A lot of us miss it. We say, well, it may not be God's will for that mountain to move. What is the definition of the will of God? 
is the word of God. We learned that from comparing Mark 3.35 and Luke 8.21. God's word is his will. Now, now, this is God's word right here. If you speak to the mountain, I'll make it move. There's his will. So it actually is God's will. Now, listen, let me let go ahead and tell you this. It is not God's will for any mountain to move until it's your will. Because if God wanted Grandfather Mountain to move, he could have already moved it, right? So it's not his will until, until you speak it. When it becomes your will, he backs you up. All the mountains belong to us. God gave the whole world to us. Let me ask you this. Is it God's will for the sun to stand still? If it did, we'd all die. We know that it's not God's will for the sun to stand still. But then one day Joshua went out and said, Sun, stand still! Because they hadn't finished fighting the battle yet. And what he bound, he bound the sun in the sky. What he bound on earth. God bound in heaven. And the sun stood still. In fact, the writer there in the, in the book of uh, Joshua said, you can check this out. And, and he gave it the name of a secular book. I believe it was the book of Jasher. He said you can check it out in these secular records. It really did happen. He wasn't making it up. And all of Israel saw it and all the people in that whole area. In fact, there's a legend. It goes back all the way back. What's that? 3,500 years. There's a legend in China that said they had a long, dark day. It was dark. Sun didn't come up one whole night. Isn't that interesting? Of course, they say it's just legend because it goes back so far. Now, I want to turn to Luke 17 and verses 3 through 6, if you're writing this down. <clears throat> My point being, <clears throat> yes, it does have to be within God's will. <clears throat> we know that salvation is in God's will, but then God says, but not everybody's being called, you know, today. They may be called 10 years from now. Uh, we know it's God's will to heal people, so we can pray for that. Uh, it may not be God's will for you to have the job you're applying for. He may want you to have a better job. Mm -hmm. So what you, But it is God's will for you to have your needs met. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you pray, Lord, supply my needs, and if you don't mind, I'd like to have that company to hire me, but this or something better. And now you know you're within the will of God. Yes. All right, now in Luke 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespasses against you, you rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he trespasses against you seven times in a day, you're to forgive him. Every time, you shall forgive him. Now, when they heard that, that was so astonishing. Wait a minute, i got to forgive this dude seven times in one day? And what did the apostles say in verse 5? Lord, he increase our faith. If I were to ask you on a level from 1 to 10, if 0 is where the sinner is, I'm talking about the wicked now, and 10 is the faith of God, now don't answer out loud. None of us know where we are on the scale from 1 to 10. But I wonder where you are. I don't know where I am. I may only be at a 5. So what do I need to do? I need to increase my faith, don't I? Until I have the faith of God, until I'm working at a 10, until I'm operating at a 10, I need to increase my faith. And you do too. You say, but I'm not wanting to move any mountains. What about mountains in your own personal life? What about them? See, I don't have any actual mountains I care to move in the mountains of North Carolina, but there are mountains in our life that we need to get rid of. We need to get them out of the way. So here's the point. You need to operate in the faith of God in your own personal life, in your marriage, your family, with your children, in your health. And what's coming ahead of us, and it may happen within the next year or two. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to encourage you. But I will tell you this. It, we have to be realistic. If, if Putin gets mad enough at us, he may attack us back. And who knows? It won't be military people that die. It'll be civilians. World War II, there were thousands of soldiers that died, but 50 million people died. Who were those 50 million? Civilians like you. Understand the vast majority of the people who died in World War II were civilians. If we have a nuclear war, the vast majority will be people like you and me. That could happen in the next year or two years. You say, that's scary. I wish I hadn't come to church today. <laughs> well, hang on. I'm not through yet. Because by the time you leave here, I want you to leave here with your head high saying, man, I'm going to make it. Give me 20 more minutes to do this. All right.
Increase our faith. Now, you say, well, Keith, I agree. I need to increase my faith, but how do I do it? Well, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you can read the scriptures over and over and over and over and over. You know, I wrote down a, a whole bunch of scriptures, 40 some scriptures that I wrote down. And I read them every day for something like 10 years to increase my faith. And you know, I still hadn't walked on water yet. Well, faith comes by hearing. So every day I would read those scriptures until I got sick of it. <laughs> faith does come by hearing. But there's something that I missed during that time that I didn't see until recently. Here, here's the answer. Go ahead, I'll take the question, then I'll, I'll give the answer here. Okay, JR is asking, it's, it's going back because of the delay. Right. Is it also contingent on us seeking first the kingdom of God and not our own desire? Yeah, and the kingdom of God, the Greek word kingdom, basileia, means basically his government, his way of life. And, of course, living by the faith of God is a part of that living by his way of life. And also, Mark 4.26 says, the kingdom is like a man who casts seed into the ground. That's what I'm getting ready to, to answer right here. Verse 5, increase our faith, and here is the way you increase it, which goes right along with that question. Here it is. You have to be proactive. You do have to be proactive, and here is how you're proactive. If you want the faith of God, and you've only got mustard seed faith, let me show you how to increase it. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, he didn't say as a, as a grain of sand, that won't work. But if you have faith like a seed, even if it's a tiny seed like a mustard seed, you might say to the sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root and be planted in the sea and it should obey you. They didn't say we don't have any faith. We've got faith, but we need it increased. Everybody here in this room have faith, but you need it increased. I certainly need my faith increased. That's one of the reasons I prepared this message. I was doing this for my own personal devotion. I said, wow, I need to share this with everybody. How do you increase your faith? Well, let me ask you this. If a farmer wants, uh, say, a cornfield, you know, he wants corn. Now, there's two ways for a farmer to get corn if he wants to have corn on the cob. He can go down to the grocery store and buy it. But if he's a farmer, what does he do? He takes the seed he's got and he sows it, doesn't he? One seed from an ear of corn, and you sow it, you get a stalk with two to three ears on it. One time I counted the, the grains on one ear of corn. I was eating corn on the cob that day, put a little bit of butter on it, making you hungry now, aren't I? So anyway, I counted the grains of, of, uh, that were on that ear of corn. There were 250. So one seed planted will give you a stalk with a whole lot more than what you sowed. You get back a lot more than what you sowed. You get back two or three ears, so you're looking at one grain, off one seed off of a it, corn of the cob, which will produce around 500 to 750 additional grains. What if you sow them? Now you've got maybe six or 700 stalks of corn. You can go into the farming business now from one seed. What the Bible says, you reap what you sow. What is it that you want? Say, Keith, I need more faith. Jesus said, if you used your faith that you've got it'll begin to increase. There's the answer. How do I get the faith of God? He said, if you have seed, if you have faith like a seed, what do you do with a seed? There's only two things you can do with it. If it's corn on the cob, you eat it. I don't know if anybody eats mustard seeds. Do they eat mustard seeds? I don't think they do, but you sow them, right? Well, if you use yeah. whole grain mustard, it's got mustard seeds in it, so yeah. You, you could. could. Mm -hmm, you could. Yeah. So we can either eat seeds or we can sow them. If you take the faith you've got right now, and I know in Thessalonians it says not every man has faith, talking about people out in the world. But to those of us in the body of Christ, Romans 12, I think it's verse 3, says God has dealt to every man the measure of faith, every man in the church. Everyone in this room has a certain amount of faith. Wait a minute. It says God has dealt to every man. Man in Greek means person, male or female. The measure of faith. Where did he get that faith? To give it to you. Where did he get it? He got it from himself. What kind of faith did God give you? He gave you his own faith, didn't he? I mean, if I give you $10, it's my $10, isn't it? Until I give it to you. So where did God get the faith to give to you? He got it from himself. So the faith that God has dealt to every one of us in this room, and every Christian watching on YouTube and on Facebook, God has dealt to you the faith of God 
But that faith of God has got to grow like a seed, and it grows and grows and grows. Matthew 13 talks about it until it gets so big the birds can lodge in the branches of that was that mustard seed. So they said, Lord, increase our faith. Jesus didn't say, okay, zap, you've got it. You went from a one to a ten. He said, no, use your faith like a seed. Sow what you've got. And believe it. Start believing it. Now, please don't come to my house and curse my fig tree because I only got one. But if you've got a tree in your backyard, maybe it's in the way. You want to get rid of it? I dated a gal some years ago. She, she, I should have run as soon as I found this out. She had a pet that was a tarantula spider. That should have told me a lot. I wish I had run right then, but I didn't. And I hated that thing. And I dated her for quite some time, and she had that tarantula spider. And she said, do you want to hold it? And I said, no, thank you. She was asleep with her spider. Ooh. That tarantula is as big as my hand, and it walk around like this. I didn't like to even look at the thing, and I don't. I didn't actually curse it, but I wished it to die, and it did. By George, she had the dumb thing stuffed by a taxidermist, and she gave it to me as a present to put on my piano. Ooh. So every time I went to play the piano, I had to look at that dumb spider. What was the question? It's like actually a comment on YouTube. Which is a good thing. Um, Nicole it made a comment. It's a ways back. Um, interesting how a, a single two-letter word of to end derails the true journey of faith for generations. Evil at yeah, work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. King James says have faith in God. But the Greek is in the genitive case. It means of. Have God's faith. If I said have the book of John, that means have John's book. It belongs to John, but here, you have it. And so have the faith of God. It's God's faith, but you get to have it, and you get to work with it. All right, so how do we know God's going to stand behind us? Because we have the faith of God. Well, how do you have the faith of God? Because you know God stands behind you. But where do you ever get to that point? Because you take the faith that you've got, and you start making decrees. Now, here's another scripture, Job 22, 28, which I read last week. It says, you shall decree a thing, and it will be established. How do you get corn? You sow what you've got and you'll get more. How do you get more faith? They said, increase our faith. He said, if you had faith like a seed, hint, 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 go sow what you've got. So I, here's, what, here's your homework assignment between now and next week. Find something you can decree. Please don't come to my yard. I've only got one fig tree. But find something that you can decree, and you decree that thing, and you believe that what you say comes to pass. But Keith, what if it doesn't come to pass? Keep on decreeing. Find something to decree until you start seeing it happening. If you know somebody's got cancer, do what I have done, and I've seen it work. Go there and curse that cancer. Jesus cursed the tree and it died. I've done this more than once where somebody had terminal cancer and was dying. I would go and curse that cancer. Now, the first thing you've got to do is build up their faith. you got to do that first. But I would curse the cancer, tell it to die, and say, okay, it's dead. And I've seen God back me up. He stood behind me and backed up. What I bound, he bound. I've seen that happen more than once. Start with something simple. Not with moving mountains, but start with something simple like cursing a cancer that somebody has. And get them healed. Start with something simple like that. And, and begin to realize you are a child of God. And Jesus said in John 14, 12, you can do the same works I do. There was a preacher I read after many years ago. Before he was ordained, he, uh, he was out with some kind of a saw or something. And uh, maybe it was a chainsaw. Anyway, he cut his thumb with a big gash in his thumb. And he had just learned about faith. And he was still a babe in, in Christ. But he grabbed his finger and he said, Lord, heal it. And there was no pain whatsoever. And he had a big gash in his hand. He didn't go to the doctor with it. He wrapped it up real good, bandaged it up. And some weeks later, he said, let me see if God really is healing it. He said, I never had any pain until I pulled the bandage off. And that's when it hurt, he said, and it left a scar for the rest of my life. He said, to this day, when I look at that scar, it reminds me that I should have just trusted God. Don't look to see if it's happening. Just believe God. I had a chainsaw out, uh, and I, thankfully my next-door neighbor was next door. He took me to the emergency, emergency room. They know Jonathan. Yeah, some of you here know Jonathan Carter. Uh and he just happened to be at home at that time. And uh, anyway, I was 
cutting a limb and slipped and one of these fingers here about split it wide open and so he took me to the emergency room they put i never in my life ever had stitches but they the doctor who stitched me up he said well i think you're not going to lose the lose use of your finger but i'm gonna tell you one thing you're gonna have severe scars for the rest of your life so he bandaged it up and i was you know i laid my hand on it afterwards and i said lord you could if, if you could heal my finger you can heal the scars don't let there be any scars take away the scars I could show you both thumbs and you can't tell which one I cut. There are no scars. None. I believe it was my right thumb. I think it was. But you can't tell by looking at it. What I'm telling you is if you'll just trust God. Start using your faith. Start decreeing some things. Now, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. Before you go and curse a cancer, first of all, pray, Lord, this man needs healing. I've built up his faith. I've gone through the scriptures with him. Matthew 9, according to your faith, be it unto you. So, Lord, I'm asking you to heal this person in Jesus' name and then stand there and curse that cancer and tell it to die. When you can start building your faith up like this, when, when these things do come to pass, maybe in the next nine years, you're going to make it through the tribulation. But how many churches out here are hearing this kind of thing? They're hearing what Martin Luther said and what John Calvin said and... Uh, I mean, some of them, all they talk about is, you know, ancient stuff. They need to be talking about what is relevant. And I'm still not through with this sermon yet today. There's so much to cover. And I'll tell you what, this is very important. Now, in Hebrews 5, verses 13 and 14, I can't quote that word for word, so I want to turn to it and read it. But here is what it says. Chapter 5 of Hebrews. If I don't finish this today, for sure I'll finish it by next week. The Lord willing. All right, now, Hebrews 5, 13 says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness because he's a baby. But strong meat belongs to them that are full age, and that's where you and I want to be. Even those who by reason of use, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you put your arm in a sling, they tell us, even though you're healthy, and you leave it in the sling for six months. When you take it out of the sling, you can barely use it because you haven't been using it. Therefore, you're getting weak. So you want to exercise your senses. How do you do that? You start using it. You've got that much faith. Bless your heart. Use it. Amen. Use that faith that you got, and it'll start to grow. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's got these big muscles. But I'm going to tell you, I've got the same muscles he's got. But the reason I don't look like him is because he's exercised him and exercised him. And he's developed them until he walks around like this. What I'm saying is everybody in this room, you have the same muscles. But the reason you don't have the strength he has is because you haven't done the same program um, that he's done, the same exercise program. You and I have the faith of God, but we need to grow it. How do we grow it? Use what you've got. You need to use what you've got. But what if I don't see it happen right away? Now, Jesus daily did miracles, by the way. 1 Peter 2, 21 says he's our example. I don't ask you to start with a fig tree, but start with something. Start making decrees. Once I got a hold of this, I said, well, I'm going to do this every day. But then I ran out of things to, to decree. But when you have an opportunity, look for opportunities to decree things. Exercise makes it work. Use what you've got. Uh, now, Let's say you make a decree and it doesn't work. First thing you do is you re-examine your faith. Don't feel bad if your faith is still that small. Every little baby that was born looks like you did when you were born. Arnold Schwarzenegger, he looked like you did when he was born. He had muscles, but they weren't yet developed. So don't feel bad if it doesn't work right away. Ephesians 5 one says we're to be followers of God. The Greek says imitators of God. God said, let there be, and it came to pass. So, number one, a lack of faith could cause it not to work, or another thing that causes it not to work is witchcraft. Exodus 22, verse 18 says you don't suffer a witch to live. What is a witch? Witchcraft is when you manipulate somebody else. This company is going to hire me. I decree they're going to hire me whether they want to or not. Uh-uh, that's witchcraft. See, that fig tree has no will of its own. I can make it do anything. That mountain has no will of its own. But I can't decree something about you. Okay, you know, I'm going to decree this person is going to give me $1,000 today. I can't do that. That's witchcraft. Mm. Now, you can pray that God will lay it on people's hearts to do certain things. 
But, you, but don't pray God make them do it. That's witchcraft, and God won't do that. Now, if you have a child and you make him go to your room, that's not witchcraft. That's in the natural. But when, he, but when you start using your faith in the supernatural realm, and if you try to force your will on somebody else, that's a sin. You can't, you can't kill somebody mm -hmm. if they don't want it. Even Jesus couldn't do that because of their unbelief. Mark 6 says Jesus could there do no mighty work. He didn't say he would not. He said he could not. It says, and, and then if you read the comparable scripture there in Matthew 13, it says because of their lack of faith. They lack faith. I need two hours to go through all this. This is There's so much in here. All right, so remember when they were in the boat, Jesus didn't say, you know, they thought they were going to die. Remember that? The storm came up. He didn't say, you don't have faith. What did he say? You remember? Anybody remember? Yeah, he did say that. But there was something else he said first. Where is your faith? All of you have a car. Where is your car? Well, it's out in the parking lot. I know you got it, but I can't see it. But if I go out in the parking lot, I can see it. Jesus said, where's your faith? I've given you faith. Where is it? Now, you can't see faith. I can't see your heart. I can't see your faith. But I see the works that your faith produces. Remember in the book of James, a man says he has works and, and I say I have faith. I will demonstrate my faith by my works. Remember when they cut the hole out in the roof of the house and they let a stretcher down and a man on the stretcher? And the Bible says, this is Mark 2, when Jesus saw their faith, what did he see? He saw what faith produced. So when, when Peter says, we're going to die, help us, help us, he says, where's your faith? So he stands up and he, he decrees. It doesn't say he prayed and begged and pleaded with God, make the storm stop. He said, peace, be still. You understand? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, in wartime, it's a little different. Lord, let me win this victory, which means let me kill a whole bunch of people. There are times like that, and even then you pray for God's will to be done. So, yeah, David prayed about his enemies, and he prayed for victory over his enemies. It's kind of like the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. And after God said that, he said, now go out here and take over Jericho and wipe them out. So in wartime, it's not murder. And the Hebrew word there literally means to murder. Yeah. For them to like be thwarted and stuff like that. Yeah. He prayed but for his enemies. That was imposing his will against them. In wartime, that's that's something different. Yeah. Okay. That's a whole different topic. Why does he allow it in wartime, but he does? It's different there. Because in wartime, they're going to kill you if you don't get them. So yes, he prayed for his enemies to be thwarted, yeah. Because he was he was constantly in the Cold War with everybody around him. And after he died, Solomon took over the Cold War was over. That's why Solomon had peace for 40 years. So in the context of today, what if you're not in a war with someone like that person is still your enemy? Mm -hmm. What do you do there? In that case, Jesus said, love your enemies, which means, it doesn't mean like them. It means he said, bless them and pray for them. If they're hungry, you feed them. Uh, if they're thirsty, you give them drink. In other words, the way you, you love your enemies is you, you do good to them, and eventually they may come around. So what if someone you know is doing something that is wrong? If they're doing something that you know is wrong, say, Lord, help them to see the light so they won't do this anymore. Now, don't decree they will see the light. Just ask God. And, 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 and I believe God will eventually answer you, but it might not come the way. It may come 10 years from now. So you can't pray, don't let him do this? Your will be done. If they're trying to kill you, I'd pray real quick, Lord, don't let him do this. <laughs> I would pray that way. But I mean, we've all, in this room, we're Christians, we've all prayed for the lost. And I will not ask you to raise your hands, but this is a rhetorical question. How many times have we prayed for people that were lost and they never did accept Christ? You know, I went to witness to a couple of my uncles that I knew didn't have Christ, and they wouldn't listen to me. You can't force your will. Lord, lay it on their heart. That's all you can do. And I think it's chapter 10 of Luke where Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest, that he'll send laborers into his harvest. Somebody can reach him. Maybe you can. There's somebody. So God will do that. But even then, God won't force that man to get saved or force him 
not to come against you. I'm out of time, but I want to give you at least one more scripture. There's a quick question. Okay, quick question. All right. Point, I think it's to Rachel's point. JR is asking, is it spiritual self-defense? Spiritual <laughs> self-defense, yeah, I would agree with that. It's a form of spiritual self-defense, yes. I'll have to conclude next week, but I do want to read one final thing, and I don't even know where it is. Here it is. It's in Luke 17. And then I'll conclude with this, because I don't want to hold you over time. I knew we wouldn't have time for a sermonette today. <clears throat> Verse 11. <clears throat> um, Verse 11. It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria. Now that's north Samaria and Galilee is north of Jerusalem. And he entered in a certain village there. There were ten men that were lepers. They stood afar off because they couldn't get near anybody with leprosy. They lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priest. That's interesting. You go back to the law, the Pentateuch, and it says, When you think you're healed, Go to the priest. Let him check you out and see if you are healed. He said, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, when he said that, they weren't healed. They had leprosy. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, from Samaria to Jerusalem, I don't know how many miles that is, but you remember the story that one came back and thanked him when they got healed? The reason all ten did not thank him on the spot it's because he did not say, be cleansed. Okay, oh, you're cleansed. Oh, great. Now go show yourself to the priest. If they were all standing there, they would have all said thank you. He doesn't say after they were healed, then they went. As they were lepers, he said, go show yourself to the priest. So here are ten men with leprosy, and all ten of them say, okay, we're going to Jerusalem. So they head off down to Jerusalem. They may have gotten two or three miles down the road. Judea is a very hilly country. They were out of sight. Now, now listen to this. This is very important. What happens if I speak to the fig tree and nothing happens? Jesus spoke to the fig tree and didn't see a thing. The disciples, it says in Mark 11, 12, and 13, it says they heard it, but they didn't see a thing. It wasn't until the next day that it manifested. And when they walked by there, Jesus didn't call their attention to the tree. He just kept on walking by. And if Peter hadn't said something about it, Jesus would have never even seen that fig tree with it because he wasn't looking. Mm. You see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. All right, now listen to this. They were out of sight. Verse 14, the last part, and it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. But they were so far away that it was too far to come back except one of the boys said, I'm going back anyway. He comes all the way back to Samaria. He's halfway to Jerusalem, maybe. And he, and he thanks Christ. He fell down on his face and he gave at his feet and he gave, gave him thanks and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, now listen to this. Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? That tells us two things. Number one, when God does you something, you should be grateful. But it tells us something else. It tells us that Jesus believed that what he said came to pass, though he never did see those other nine men cleansed. Did he say, oh, I feel so sorry for those nine. They didn't get anything. I guess what I said didn't come to pass. Only this one poor fellow got it. He didn't say that. He said, weren't there ten cleansed? How did he know all ten were healed? He didn't. He didn't have a GPS. He didn't have a cell phone to say, hey, you guys doing okay? How did he know 10 were cleansed? Because he believed that what he said would come to pass even though he never saw it. The faith of God is to believe that fig tree is going to die or that cancer is going to die and you turn around and walk off and say it's done and you believe it. You cast out demons the same way. You believe that what you say comes to pass. You say, Keith, but that's the faith of God and I don't have it. You do have the faith of God. You just need to grow it and grow it. And you start making some decrees now. Start using your faith today before the sun sets. You start using the faith that God has given you. And that faith will begin to grow. You reap what you sow. What do you want to reap? More faith. What do you sow? Sow the faith of God. You reap what you sow.
Jesus said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the, where are the others? He never did see those other nine. And yet he declared they were cleansed. You know what a lot of us do? And I'll conclude with that. I've got more to say. But here's what a lot of us do. We go and pray for somebody. Then we go on the telephone and say, well, did it work? No, I'm still dying. Oh, it's too bad. I'm sorry it didn't work. I told you, and I'll conclude with this because I know we're over time. I told you about the man that <clears throat> he was a member of my church back when I first was ordained, and he had a brain tumor. And to make a long story short, I tried and tried and tried and tried and tried to build up his faith. And when we had communion to his house, I said, now, you know, by his stripes you're healed, and that's what we're looking at here. So, so after we take communion, I'm going to lay hands on you, and I'm going to curse that brain cancer. And you agree with me that God has healed you. When I get through praying, you raise your hands and thank God that you have your healing. When I got through praying for him, I had so much faith that night. He raised one hand. He was sitting on the chair like this. He raised one hand and said, thank you, brother, for praying for me. I don't know why God won't heal me. And he died. Because he had his mind made up he was going to die. What you believe is what you get. What we need to do is start believing that what we say comes to pass. Now, you've got to watch what you say. Don't say that tickled me to death. And you believe that what you say comes to pass. Don't say things you don't believe. Train your heart to believe that everything you say comes to pass. Now, let me say this, and we will conclude for today. I've got more in my notes, but we'll conclude. Just early this morning, Billy sent me something. He said, have you seen your text messages yet? And I said, no, I hadn't looked. He said, well, go look. And I'm going to share this with you, and then I, and we'll, we'll be dismissed. I told you that if Christ does come back in our lifetime, most likely it would be at the 40th Jubilee. And I said, there's a lot that's got to happen in the next nine years for that to come to pass based on what's happening in Europe and in Russia and what's happening in our government, inflation and everything else, it looks like it could be getting there. But what else has to happen first, remember? The temple has to be rebuilt. Or sacrifices. Or sacrifices. When, those, when that first daily sacrifice is offered, this is what Billy sent me this morning. Here is a, this was copied right off the internet, right? Yeah. Jews begin building third temple on Israel Independence Day. And the date is yesterday, May 6, 2022. He also brought me some papers. This came off the internet too. Here are some actual stones. And it says now here, cutting stones for the third temple. They say they can have the temple built in six months. Whether they're actually starting or they're just getting ready to start, Folks, do you understand everything is coming together for the tribulation to come, for the day of the Lord to come, and for Jesus to come back? But we're going to need the faith of God to get through the times ahead. Are there any questions? I'm sorry for over holding you a little bit over time. No questions. No comments. Everybody think I'm crazy? Um, Patty said... Patty, okay. We've got one comment. Patty in New Mexico. Yeah. Never thought about mountains in my life this the, this helps build my faith yeah. and there's another comment I mean I don't I guess he is not going to have a problem with me reading it since he posted it in the chat for the whole world to see mm -hmm. so um, Kyle Perkins um, who Kyle Perkins okay he said hello Keith it's Kyle Perkins I've studied under you while in prison and followed you through your videos I'm grateful for you, and I want you to know that. Thank you so much for reaching me while I was in a sick, dark place and for teaching me the wonderful truths of God's Word. Amen. Amen. I mean, I don't think I'm out of line reading that. No, put it on no, the no, time, no, no, I wouldn't so. think so. I wouldn't think so. Well, I won't keep you any longer. I'm sorry I held you a little bit over time, but, but do you realize how serious our situation is now in the world? In two years from now, we don't know where we're going to be. We don't even know if we're going to be able to still be alive two years from now if Russia carries out its threats. So start building your faith today. Start building it. Go back and look up these scriptures. Study them. Take them seriously. Lord, thank you for each one who's here, who, each one who's watching over the internet. Help us to not just hear these words, but to do them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Thank you for coming. Hey, so I forgot to introduce our guest here. This is Sandra. This is her first time here. Say hello to her before you leave. Good to see Deborah again. And good, good to see everybody here. God bless you all. And you took it back there too. God bless. We're dismissed. Yes. <clears throat> you should when you get finished, it automatically.